Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we are returning to Suzerain Rizia, the new DLC out for Suzerain, which is sort of a choose-your-own-adventure-style visual novel presidential simulator, although in Rizia you actually rule a monarchy, whereas in the base game you rule a, a republic. Uh, but this is a game which basically puts you in the shoes of a ruler of a country. There are, is a story that you go through throughout the game where you're given mostly all text dialogue from your different aides, your different folks that you're interacting with as a ruler of a country, and then the decisions that you have to make to rule that country, and then the outcomes that come of that are fairly dynamic. It's not a strategy game in the slider sense. You're not moving sliders around to be like, I'm going to min-max this economy. It's... It's really more like what I would imagine being a actual ruler of a country is like, where your aides present you options and you choose amongst those options of what to do. Or maybe you push back against them. But again, much more qualitative than quantitative in a typical strategy game sense. We've played this game on the channel multiple times before, but the Rizia DLC came out on Monday. One of my most anticipated games to come out this year. We live-streamed it over on my Twitch channel on Monday night, uh, and this is the second part of that series. We've just gotten started as the King of Rizia. We've recently been sort of gone through the ceremony, the, the coronation. We've sort of had an early mo morning lunch or breakfast with our mother, who's sort of the queen consort. Uh, her husband, the previous king, passed away. Uh, we've got our daughter with us as well, and we're going to be going to some initial council member meetings and beginning to meet the different aides around the table, if you will, who are supposed to serve us and serve the different interests and royal families within this monarchy. It's a very interesting looking game. I'm enjoying myself so far in it, but without further ado, let's just jump back into this thing and pick things up where we left off last time. We'll just have to be mindful of that going further. Uh read what report house of delegates hold first allegiance ceremony for the occasional for the occasion of the first Rizian coronation since the founding of the house of Del delegates majority leader daria de rava called a special session where members took an oath of allegiance to the crown okay no matter what you choose you'll regret it later gotcha that's kind of the rule of the original swordland game too to a large degree the steroids to the royal council chambers were longer than I remembered. Hurry up, father. It's not very kingly of you to be late. Easy there, daughter. Easy. You're wrong. It's very kingly of me to show up whenever I want. A true king is never late. It is the others who are early. I'd only been here once or twice. I gazed up at the high domed ceiling with its skylight, skylight that shone down on the center of the room. Below it, at a tall black red velvet chair, towered over an oval mahogany table. To my slight surprise, the room was empty except for one man, my uncle. When Hugo saw me, he sprang to his feet. Welcome, your majesty. I embraced my uncle, and he hung, hugged me back warmly. You'll meet everyone else soon enough, but I thought a private chat with your Grand Vizar would be in order first. His eyes traveled to the doorway where Vina was standing. Although it seems it won't be as private as I was expecting, are you staying, Princess Vina? My daughter gave a shy nod. Yes, Uncle Hugo, I'm sitting in on the King's Council meetings. I know it's unorthodox, but future queens should have the same privileges as future kings. Hugo frowned as he processed this new information, then broke into a smile. By all means, then, your highness, have a seat. Vina walked over to the table as I made my way to the red velvet chair. Once we were all seated, I turned to my uncle. How's your wife? Rita is as much of a thorn in my side as ever. She was begging me to retire after Valero's death. As though I'd trust anyone else to advise my nephew. 
As I listened to him, my eyes drifted toward the back wall. It was covered in portraits of Rizia's previous kings, including a newly painted likeness of my father. My dear brother, I do miss him, but I dare say it's time we had some fresh blood on the throne. As Valero never got a chance to fill you in on his royal duties before he passed, I prepared an overview for you. Would you like to hear it? Please. As the king, you're both Rizia's head of state and commander of its armed forces, as well as the de jure governor of Rizia's imperial Valkyrs, the Pales administrative district, and the island of Calabas. Like your father and grandfather or grandmother before you, you alone have the power to shape the country by passing royal decrees. As is tradition over hundreds of years, each new ruler has passed the sovereign transition and clemency decrees to start the reign. The kingdom will be expecting your decree very soon. Tradition is the enemy of progress. We should not be bound by the past. Thank you for your advice, Uncle. It's comforting to have your wisdom and experience guiding me at the start of my reign. The decree will play a significant role in my reign. They won't just be symbolic gestures, but tools to shape the future of Rizia. I would never go against the traditions of Rizia. I will sign the decree as soon as possible, and I've been looking forward to this all my life. Finally, I have the power to make decisions completely unchallenged. That's a little bit egotistical. Um, thank you for your advice, Uncle. It is comforting to have your wisdom and experience guiding me at the start of my reign. Your humility is appreciated, but remember, being king is about making hard decisions, not just following advice. Hugo reached for a neatly rolled parchment lying on the grand table. With deliberate movements, he unro unrolled it, revealing the prepared royal decree. The intricate script and the seal of Rizia were glint glinting under the ch chandelier's light. I and the rest of the royal council will advise you to the best of our ability and put forth decrees and state decisions for your approval. Ultimately, the king has the final say. However, you should not neglect the House of Delegates, the legislative assembly my brother set up to appease the opposition after the uprising. That's right, his theater of puppets. That was one of his better ideas. I thought so as well. It gave Rizia the appearance of a constitutional democracy while keeping power firmly in the hands of the king. His Majesty Valero presided over the last election in 1949. The Rizian National Coalition secured a House majority, as always. They proposed decrees and issue official approvals or disapprovals of the laws passed by you and the Council. A grand vizar is that's traditional for me to attend their sessions and pass any relevant information on to you. I'll be counting on you. Of course, Your Majesty. With that said, I would advise you to take the delegates' input into account. No good can come of ignoring the will of the people. Okay. We're bad. Do the de delegates really represent the will of the people, or just the nobility? Tut, tut, tut. Do not dis count the importance of the nobility to the kingdom, my nephew. Keep them satisfied, and commoners' will lives will be better for it. But if you want a self-styled man of the people, look no further than the opposition. More specifically, the new leader, Manus Sazon. Manus Sazon is the leader of the Rizian's People Party, as well as the heir to the House of Sazon. He was born on the island of Kelguabiz, shortly after the exile of his mother, former Duchess Isa. Oh, so he's the son of the, uh, the executed father. This is why we should have killed... Sorry. That's bad. That's bad to say. But he shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Environmental conservation measures in the Brennan National Forest, improvements in national health care policy, and the establishment of dedicated funds to support Rizian contemporary artists. It's never too late for an accident, I guess. The traitor's son. Exactly. 
As you know, Duke Lucas Sazan was executed for his role in your kidnapping in the 1926 uprising, while his wife Angelica was sent into exile on Calcobiz. While she remains under strict orders not to leave the island, no such restrictions were placed on the son she gave birth to shortly after her arrival. He opened the folder and took out a picture of a clean-cut young man, Vina, leading forward to peer at it. Upon finishing his studies in Kurut Man- Watch- Oh. Hey guys, I have no idea what's gonna happen, but how much you wanna bet Vina falls in love with the son of the traitor who shot me? Just saying. That, that's what would happen if this was a daytime sitcom. Uh, upon finishing his studies in Kirut Manus, returned to the mainland and proceeded to win the largest supporter base of any opposition leader we've seen thus far. His promises to give a voice to the common man seem to be resonating with the populace. Part of it, at least. And my, my daughter's going to be like, Oh yes, he speaks for the people. We should follow his advice. Uh Okay. Common man, he's descended from nobility. Yeah, that's what makes him particularly dangerous. While I'm on the subject, a word about our houses. House Taurus. Our family currently controls the province of Valkyries, as well as the city state of Isa. How is it doing now that I've left? Stable as always, with you on the throne, me as Grand Vizar, and Rico and Isa, the governing seat has been filled by Hubertus, a distant cousin of ours. Of course, Princess Vina is eligible to take his place at the reigning duchess. As the reigning duchess. In a few years, maybe. I still don't feel ready. You're already smarter than I was when I became Duke. But it's your decision. Thank you, Father. In any case, Your Majesty, I don't expect any trouble in there during your reign. It remains the wealthiest of Rizia's provinces and the least affected by crime. Keep their lives comfortable and the locals there will stay loyal to you. What's really going on in Isa? Has Rico been well received as Duke? Hugo's face hardened. Isa has been difficult since the Saison Rebellion. Even more so now that native Rizians are in danger of being crowded out by migrants. He spat out the last word with some distaste. Considering the circumstances, I believe my son is doing just fine. Is Su Omna still based there? Yes, and I shudder to think of what Isa would be like without it. What about Riza Imperi? We control that too, don't we? Yes, Port Drazan is, and the, its metropolis are controlled by the central government, and therefore House Taurus. You don't need to worry about pleasing our house in, the, in this region, though. It's more crucial to retain the favor of the major corporations that are based here. Understood. If our economy takes a hit, another uprising won't be far behind. Precisely. The Pale's administrative district is also under the jurisdiction of Riza Imperi since we reclaimed it in the early 20s. As for the other houses, House Saison? Yes, aside from Isa, which is now under Rico's governance, all of Brennus is still their territory. The nobles there swore fealty to the crown in exchange for keeping a hold on their cities and their estates. But the return of Angelica's boy could test that loyalty. He is their rightful duke, after all. My father was too soft on the Saisons. I'll keep them in line. He cannot be a duke and claim to represent democratic values at the same time. A contradiction, isn't it? He discourages his fellow delegates from using the title, but he has yet to officially renounce it. Lest we forget, Valen is scheduled to return Zeal to Rizia next year. 
The Saisons expect the region to become part of their province as it was before the uprising. The power balance between the houses is fragile enough. Adding so much land to Brennus would upset it beyond repair. I don't see any downside to that. Seems perfectly fine. Um... I mean, realistically, it's a bargaining chip no matter what, right? If we don't, if the thing is it is fragile, we don't want to make them too strong, but maybe they'll be happy if we return it to them? I'm not sure. Use it as a bargaining chip, stay loyal to us. Now you're thinking like a king! <laughs> and finally, House Azaro. Precisely, the rulers of. Cardese Monteclar and the stewards of the Rizian military. You must be aware of their patriarch Thaddeus's poor health. The general suffered a stroke shortly after King Valero's death. Yes, he was. I was saddened to hear. He taught me everything I know. His daughter, Lukita, the Duchess of Monteclar, volunteered to take his place as war and secretary counselor. You'll meet her soon. You should know. That factions within her province have begun calling for the return of Pals again. Pals hasn't been part of Rizia for over a century. It's a lost cause. What are the what are our relations with Pals again? I don't even know. This game is 100% nepotism. Well, we are a monarchy there, M. A max. By the way, Sim Kill? Key? Sim Kill? Thank you for the follow. Nathan, Southbird, Enthalpulflow, Sip, Sepa, Sea, Sea Ape? Sea Ape? Oh my god, I can't read. Tom Goblin, W. Clark. Well, that was yesterday, but anyway. I don't know what we should do here. Like, I, do, I did say I want to reclaim our lands, right? So, I won't let them down. I'll finish with the what the general started. Be careful. We all know how the last campaign against the Grand Duchy ended. Yes, but now I have a navy. We can interdict those supplies. One more thing. As you're aware, a few years before your father's death, he reinstated the Golden... Or the... Yeah, the Golden Guard. The personal security of my father, and where are they now? Here, sir. Ready and able. Titus Gordion. For the first time, I noticed the man standing in the corner of the room. He was wearing a tight-fitting gold blazer that barely concealed his muscular physique. Meet Titus Gordion, captain of the Golden Guard. He and his men have been keeping close watch on you since the co coronation. What the hell? <laughs> I'm pleased to meet you, Captain Gordion. Call me Titus, sir. Titus and his dozen men have been trained in the upper echelons of Rizia's elite military and police academies. Each has sworn an oath to protect the king and his family at all costs. Okay. What's with the costumes? Wouldn't plain clothes bodyguards be more effective? So they're guarding Vina and Queen Estella as well? They have you have eyes on my on the queen mother as you speak. Well, that's a little sus, little sus. <laughs> Vina looked a little flustered. Didn't Queen Liza discontinue the Golden Guard because she thought they made royal elite look elitist? She trailed off because she thought they were getting too powerful. It's why our current force is less than a third of the size it once was. Oh, so you had thirty six men, so much more powerful. Gonna launch a coup with 36 men. I guess you could certainly assassinate the king, but... Your father always had a fondness for Rizian traditions, so he spared no expense in bringing the guard back. I'm humbled to be worthy of such an elite unit's protection. The humility is all mine, sir. Thank you, Titus. You may wait outside the chamber until the meeting's conclusion. 
Noon already. Shall we and the young heiress break for a glass of wine before the council convenes this afternoon? Uh... I don't drink, Hugo. But I don't want to be a cold fish. But I also don't want to, like... I don't know. This feels important. I feel like he's trying to get me to sort of expose myself as making him the inside man. Another time, Your Grace. I know how overwhelming the move to the capital can be, Your Highness. If you ever need someone to talk to, remember you can always count on me, or come to me. It's very kind of you, Uncle Hugo. Yes, too kind. No offers of advice for me? <laughs> He's trying to get me drunk. Two's the polite option. Okay. Coal deposits suspected in Havas. I'm not gonna have any money left to do anything to mine new stuff. Unveiling the legacy of the Reznid Empire. In a groundbreaking development that has captured the kingdom of Rizia's imagination, the archaeologists in the esteemed city of Topaz have unearthed remnants of what appears to be a major city from the long-lost Reznid Empire. The extensive layout marked by grandiose architecture and elaborate frescoes suggests a significant center of commerce, governance, and culture, reflective of a bygone golden era of prosperity. Nilvasur oil field on the verge of depletion. That's not good. Industry reports reveal that Nelvisar oil field, once among Rizia's most prolific sites, is nearing the end of its productive life, with experts predicting significant output decline within the next year. The imminent depletion has prompted calls for increased investment in alternative energy sources and a reevaluation of Rizia's long-term energy strategy. So we're an oil state that's running out of oil. That's not good. Um, sovereign transition and clemency by this royal decree. The kingdom of Rizia solely affirms the traditions of the crown, blah, blah, blah. Neutral, neutral. Approve, approve, approve. Concurrent with the auspicious transition, King Romus, in his inaugural act of clemency, extends a royal pardon to 500 individuals convicted of minor offenses. So, he, nobody's opposed to it, and most people approve of it. It does reduce authority, though. So, we've got three declare, decrees that are available to us. The sovereign decree, decree here. Three approvals, two neutrals, reduces one authority. Housing for Poor Initiative, RPP proposal. A new ambitious housing program is dedicated to the kingdom's homeless and those grappling with extreme financial constraints. By guaranteeing housing for every citizen, the state reiterates its commitment to unity, prosperity, and social harmony. Such endeavors are anticipated to cement public trust and ensure tranquility across Rizia. Council of Treasury approves. Religious Dude approves. Counselor of War and Grand Vizar disapprove, and Council of Foreign Affairs is neutral. And then excavation of Topa's ancient Rizid city. So, by the way, what was the uh, minus one authority, minus one budget? Okay. Excavation of Topa's ancient Rizid city. Negative two authority, negative two budget, negative two turn construction, or approximately two turn construction, plus two tourism. All right, so everybody kind of approves this one. So the problem here becomes very quickly money. We've spent two on royal lavish parties. If I had that two back, I could do this for free. I don't know at what point authority starts to become a problem. But tourism's probably good for the economy. The problem is we kind of have been a bit of a nationalist in our early phase. So maybe that's not good. 
Tourism increase could help with money. That is true. What's the, um... Let's do our introductory briefing first. I don't think I have to make a decision on those other things quite yet. It was late afternoon when Vina and I headed back to the chambers for the first council meeting. Should I have shown up drunk? Yep, if I had drunk, I would have shown up drunk. I was glad I refused his offer of wine. As we crossed the palace gardens, I had a feeling I was being watched. Suddenly, I noticed a young man standing next to the path. His face matched the photograph of Hugo had shown me that morning. Duke Sazon, I presume. What are you doing here? Explain yourself! I mean, I am a king. I am a king! I should just ignore him, right? Just keep walking? Okay, I'll just... Whatever. Royals, royalty doesn't ignore royalty, right? At least respond. Duke Saison, I presume. He smiled nervously. I hold no land, your majesty, but you may use that title if you wish. It is brave of you to approach me. So you're the man who would topple the monarchy. You're the traitor's son. <laughs> the son of the man who shot me. Okay. I don't even know this guy yet. I don't like his dad, but his dad's dead, so... It's good to see you in Port Drazon. He tugged at his suit lapel. I wanted to introduce myself before our first official meeting. I may be the leader of the opposition, but I am not your enemy. If you and I establish a dialogue, I believe there is much we can accomplish for our country. Vina, get the fuck out of here! We already talked about this! You're not marrying this man! How lovely of you to say that. I'm Vina Torres, by the way. God damn it! He resisted the urge to laugh. I know. A pleasure to make your acquaintance. Bring your daughter to work day has been a bad idea. All around. Vina, go to your room. Ugh. Next time, she will not be allowed to attend. They're already going behind my back. Why is she giving him an encouraging smile? Did she set this up? Did she? Is she the reason that he ambushed me here? Don't speak to him, Vina. We're going to be late. Stay away from me, Mr. Saison, and even further from my daughter. <laughs> um. Um. Oh, my God. I don't even know. I don't even know. So... Two is chill. I wish we could stay and talk, but the princess and I must be going until next time. Two might be too chill, though, right? My, <laughs> I like that my initial response to her smiling was basically four. Two is non-committal as well. It doesn't say, like, I'm interested in your proposition. It is... I'm sorry, we're not going to talk about this. We have to be going. Don't speak to Mavina. We're going to be late. Uh, I guess maybe. I don't know. I wish we could stay and talk, but the princess and I must be going. Until next time. It's exciting to flirt with the son of the man who tried to kill your father. And who didn't, isn't, I'm sorry, I'm misremembering the story. Wasn't his father the, oh wait, yeah, okay, I'm, never mind, I'm dumb. He seems nice. Mm. Nice, my foot. That man has all kinds of ulterior motives. 
Don't get too smitten. He's the opposition, after all. Nice my foot. He has all sorts of ulterior motives. We continue to walk to the council chambers. Oddly enough, I still felt like someone had their eyes on us. I looked back just for long enough to see the flash of gold. Titus, of course. Don't make him out to be the bad guy. She'll want more of him. Maybe. We entered the chambers where Hugo was already waiting for us. No sooner had we sat down than a brief rap came on the door. Without waiting for the answer, Lucia Azaro rushed in. The new war and secretary counselor was younger than I imagined, just past her mid-thirties. She carried herself with a mix of regal elegance and sol soldierly authority. Okay, so, alright, well, let's just take a step back. I know we're playing this slowly, guys, but my understanding is it's also a shorter DLC, like the story is shorter than, uh, than the base game. So, daughter's interested in the opposition. Our wife died. And the person, I guess the daughter of the man who taught me everything I knew as a soldier, is in her mid-30s. I'm in my mid-40s. The royal marriage is not too far apart. Just saying. Is this just going to all be like marriage and intrigue, or am I just making all this shit up? <laughs> Pardon my interruption. She bowed to, toward me. Uh, please accept House Azaro's formal congratulations on your coronation, Your Majesty. I motioned for her to stand. Her eyes were fixated on my uncle's shirt as she raised herself. Hugo, Your Grace, your shirt is buttoned wrong. What? My uncle looked chastised. Oh, hello, Princess Vina. Would you like a coloring... What the fuck? Okay. Uh... <laughs> She's 18, Duchess Azaro. A cognac, then? She gave Vina a wide smile. Please don't mind me, Duchess Azaro. I'm here to learn and observe as the royal heir. So was that a joke that I just totally botched? I'm a little confused here. But anyway, Lucita's brow wrinkled and she gave a curt nod. So I see. My father always spoke highly of you, Your Majesty. I wish he was the one greeting you today. He sends his regards, or he would if he were capable of speaking in full sentences. She was trying to be flippant, but I could sense emotion behind her words. I know the general. He's got some fart left in him. Yeah. This must be a difficult time for you. Let me know if there's anything I can do. The corners of her mouth twitched downward. I'm not a porcelain doll, your majesty. My ability to perform my duties is in no way compromised. The others should be right behind me. As if on cue, I heard the voices of a... That was me trying to be kind and leaving the door open to her, but apparently that doesn't work on her. I should have gone with the... Uh, he's still got some fight left in him, I'm guessing. Uh, as if on cue, I heard the voices of Elena Werner and... Lorento Esquibel. I'm so bad at pronouncing names that probably makes watching these streams of mine not enjoyable. But I'm sorry, guys. My treasurer in the Council of Foreign Affairs. For Dast's sake, Lorento, you don't need to hold the door open for me every single time. I'm not as fragile as I look. I keep telling you how I could allow a door to close on such a gorgeous face. As the two senior counselors stepped in, they immediately dropped their flirtatious routine and assumed a look of deference. Is this just, in my head, everybody's sleeping with everybody in this scenario? My daughter with the opposition, you know, my character being interested in the war secretary, these two other counselors apparently flirting with each other. Uh, okay. Your Majesty, it's a pleasure and an honor to serve on your council. Despite her grandmotherly appearance, her demeanor was all business. Your reputation proceeds to your majesty. I've heard marvelous things about the work you did in Valkyries. What kind of a kick did the last man run? Yeah, major sus. Definitely sus. I don't need your approval, Mr. Werner. Thank you, Miss Werner and Mr. Asabal. I look forward to working with you. Yeah, no, I'm not going to, like, undermine my authority. 
I, I, my gut says no need for flattery. That's what I would say personally, but I probably wouldn't add the bowing down to you bit. I'm pleased to see the young heiress is here as well. A new Liza the Great in the making. Vina blushed. I wouldn't go that far, but I do hope you'll tell me about your time in Queen Liza's court one day. Uh, I'd love to. There's just a few updates I gotta share with your father first. Once all the council is receded, Hugo began. Thank you for all joining us. I'm pleased to have the entire council here for its first meeting. Well, not the entire council. The Grand Viseman is in Palvo, preparing, preparing for the upcoming religious ceremony with His Majesty. But he needn't involve himself in earthly concerns like our royal treasury. He smiled to himself and then gestured at Elena. No, indeed. That's for me to worry about. She put her hair, blah, blah, blah. Surely His Majesty already has some awareness regarding the state of Rizia's economy and resources. We're incredibly wealthy. What else do I need to know? <laughs> uh... I do, but I'd like an update from you regardless. Certainly, Your Majesty. She smoothly adjusted her reading glasses before continuing. Rizia is still one of the wealthiest country on the Mer... Copian continent, but His Majesty the late King Valero bequeathed us a number of challenges that the de that department. Where should I start? Tell me about our governing budget. It's healthy, Your Majesty. Since we began trading with Rumberg, we've been running a surplus. One that's quite high for our region, though of course there's plenty of room for, for improvement. His Majesty King Valero was hesitant to increase government spending. Perhaps even too hesitant. No, do not need to sugarcoat it. He was a miser. Um, that's great to hear. It is. Especially with the state of the military modernization measures I have in mind. Elena purs pursed her lips. With all due respect, Duchess Azaro, I'm not sure the military is the king's number one focus. Why wouldn't it be, Miss Verna? Rizia continues to have many enemies, both foreign and internal. Mm. Uh, well, we did say we wanted to retake the land, so... Why wouldn't it be? Very well said, Your Majesty. We cannot rely on the likes of Valen or Rumberg to protect us. Ultimately, shouldn't that money be spent on the Rizian people? Think of the advances. Oh my god, this guy definitely has a British accent. He's like this stereotypical like actor in like a PBS series of like an old like old British bureaucrat type deal, I feel like. Just that look. I don't mean that in a pejorative sense either. I'm just saying like he's got that that look. Ultimately, shouldn't that money be spent on the Rizian people? Think of the advances we were able to make during the Lysia era due to the Queen's investment in citizen welfare. You recall her famous quote, True prosperity is not defined by the amount of gold in our coffers, but by the health and happiness of each soul within our border. Thank you. More pragmatically, a happy and well-fed populace is one thing that does not rise up against its leader. On the other hand, there can be no welfare without security. What good is health or happiness if we are unable to defend ourselves? Hugo put up a hand. I will point out that Rizia's wealth and my mother's judicious handling of it was one of the factors that allowed us to survive the century of revolutions. However, those were different times. As a modern nation and an era of increasing superpower influence, we are expected to have a certain standard of the military. Uh, and then there's the fact that we're sandwiched between the highly contentious regions of Zill and Pales. Precisely, Your Majesty. We've got to be prepared for the worst case scenario, even if that doesn't happen. Your enthusiasm is heartening, Duchess Azaro, even if I personally believe our spending should be directed elsewhere. Any further questions, Your Majesty? What's been going on with the gold industry? Well, Your Majesty, gold is still the backbone of the Rizian economy. 
We have a number of active mines within the country operated by the Rizian Royal Gold Corporation. She and Hugo exchanged glances. And unfortunately, we cannot talk about the Rizian Royal Gold without talking about its CEO. CEO. Why do we have to talk about him? It's Rizian Royal Gold, after all. We'd better get that discussion over with. For better or worse, our country's gold stores rely on Russello, Russello Montoro. Ah, they had to make him heavy. They'd be like, oh, he's the fat cat, literally. Rus Rosselio Rusty Montero, known to all as Rusty, is the CEO of the Rizian Royal Gold Corporation and the wealthiest commoner in the country. Few concrete facts are known about his province and upbringing. He claims to have been born into an impoverished family in Malcos, an industrial area in southern Rizian Imperial. However, interviews have, made, have surfaced in which he admits to having a middle-class childhood in the Port Grazon suburbs. Halfway through his studies at Torah Imperial University, he accepted an internship at the Agno branch of the Rizian Royal Gold in southwest Brennus. Within a year, he became a junior mine supervisor, dropping out of college to further his career. His rapid ascent within the ranks of the RRG was marked by a combination of sharp business acumen and relentless ambition, as well as fortuitous connections and decisions that some have labeled as ethically questionable. He took over the company in 1935 after engineering a vote of no confidence in the prior CEO. His first act as chief executive was to secure a broad majority to file a retroactive lawsuit against the Rizian government, bastard, for the loss of revenue in Zill, which had previously handed, been handed over to Valen eight years previously. Uh, he is known to have many connections with high-ranking politicians and business people, both within the Rizia, Rizia and beyond. Aside from gold, he had made substantial investments in finance, technology, and energy, and he's also the chair of the Heart of Gold Foundation, a philanthropic organization that provides scholarships and mentorships to children from low-income backgrounds. He had a series of high-profile marriages and divorces, most recently with daytime television star Marcia Marzen. Okay, so apparently he has sued the government for considerable lost revenues. Uh, review of blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to read all of this. RG's headquarters blah, currently operates most of its mines in Brennus Province region. Its CEO, Rusty Montoro, holds majority ownership in the company. Okay. So, I guess we don't own it? Mr. Montoro, who insists on being called Rusty, currently owns 70% of the Rizian Royal Gold. How does he own that much? As much as I respect Rusty, I believe we royals should be in charge of our gold mines. How is that allowed to happen? Rusty's first move after taking the company was to sue your father's government for loss of revenue connected to the Zill handover. After a lengthy back and forth, it was agreed that the kingdom's share in RRG be decreased from 45 to 30 percent. Rizia should not own 30% of RG or even 45%. The entire com company should be nationalized. I don't see any problem with that. We should have... Uh, okay. I want one or two, right? Two? We should nationalize it? Seems a little radical. Seems a little bit radical. Um... They took our gold! Mm, what if we want our original stake back? Curry enough favor with Rusty and it should be possible, but any more than 45% will be difficult. The patent for RRG's proprietary mining technology was filed in Ventra City, Arcasia, and most of its financial assets are kept in Kirut. Okay, so Arcasia is like the United States in this game, as a reminder. And Kirut is what? Some offshore banking comp But in any event, if the patent is in Arcasia, that probably spells trouble to us nationalizing it. That would piss off the, the Americans. Attempting to nationalize the company would strip, a, strip it of substantial amount of its value. Because we'd lose the patent. Because it's in Arcasia. And the assets aren't even held in our country. So, yeah. 
Nationalizing it, not a viable option, it sounds like. At least not a smart option. RRG may control mining within Rizia, but the royal government is a direct stakeholder in the Meftin International Trade Zone. She enrolled a map of the map pointed to the region of East Morelia. Okay. The double blow of losing our mines in Zil and 15% of our RRG stake made us quite reliant on the gold from the myths. Lorento stroked his mustache. I, it was established shortly before you joined the Royal Council, was it not, Elena? I heard the negotiations between Rizia, Vagslin, Lesbasia, and Morelia took over a year. When we get Zil back, will we get its gold back as well? I certainly hope so. Valen has been mining extensively in the region since taking over in 1927. But as the ter per the terms of our agreement, Zill and all of its resources therein will return to Rizian ownership in 1952. And at the time of our last survey, there was much more than 30 years worth of gold in the ground there. Unless they strip mined it all before we left. Like they could be working double time to get all the gold. How much say does the government have over operations in the myths? A fair amount. Any chances to regulations or profit shares have to be agreed on by all four nations involved. RRG gets a percentage of MIT's profits for the use of its technology, but we can make decisions without Mr. Montoro's input. Alright, what about increasing our mining efforts within Rizia to make it for the loss? There's a number of promising sites that have yet to be explored. We just need to give the Rizian Royal Gold permission to begin excavations, which might involve the expropriation of noble pro property depending on where the mines are located. That covers all topics on gold. Okay, what about our energy holdings? Of course, Your Majesty, this is a new era for us, or area for us, compared to gold, but the financial possibilities are intriguing indeed. I thought we just saw that one of the oil, mine, oil facilities is running out. Though our state energy company is now called Rizian Oil and Gas Production, of the former has slowed over the last year, and it's threatening to come to a complete halt. The latter, however, shows potential. Our most productive gas field is off the coast of Topaz. Assuming enough money is invested into the expansion, we can expect to fuel our kingdom for years to come. Or we can spend our budget elsewhere as we wait for access to the new field south of Kabulawiz. Careful, Miss Werner. One shouldn't count on one's pheasants before they've been bagged. What field would that be? Well... We're still in the extremely early stages, but we may have at least a partial claim to a substantial reserve of natural gas between the Port of Pales and the Rizian island of Calcabiz. Drill, baby, drill! <laughs> I'd like nothing more, Your Majesty, but protocol must be followed. Our researchers have been investigating the field's size and borders. Once those are known, it'll be easy to determine ownership. Of course, we're all liaison liaising extremely closely with Pales to avoid misunderstanding. As well we should. Nobody wants a repeat of the last conflict. Are you sure, Lucidia? I thought you were big on war. Really, Duchess Azaro? Your family isn't itching for a rematch? If the Grand Duchy does not provoke us, we will not provoke them. Lucidia nodded. As much as my family is clamoring for a repeat of the Pales campaign, I think it best to ignore them. Of course, if Pales shows hostility toward us, we will react in kind. But Rizia should not be the first to resort to aggression. I don't know why we're even discussing a military response. We'll surely be able to reach a compromise using proper diplomacy. Vina, you said you were going to be quiet. You keep interjecting yourself! Time to grow up, my daughter. In real life, there's always a winner and a loser. <laughs> okay. <sighs> don't interrupt my counselors, Vina. You'll speak only when spoken to. I don't like any of these options. One in three. Just needlessly offensive to her. And I don't want to piss off the Duchess either. Like, I don't want to be putting my counselors down behind my daughter. In real life, there's always a winner and a loser. 
Oh, but... We should save this discussion for if and when we know more about the gas field in question. For now, there are any other questions? How much of our revenue comes from taxes? A resource-based economy allows us to have some of the lowest tax rates on the continent. It's been a real boon for the economy. The central government does collect a flat income tax of 10%. It's mostly paid by workers since nobles have no income to speak of. Could we generate extra revenue by introducing estate or inheritance taxes? Yeah! Let's end the nobility. That's the way the British did it. They started introducing land taxes in, that, like in the early 1900s, and that kind of torpedoed British nobility's influence pretty rapidly. Like, obviously, there's still some semblance of it, but not like it was. Let's see what they say to this. We definitely could, Your Majesty. I do happen to think that taxing wealthy nobles makes more sense than taxing the workers who generate said wealth. On the other hand, the current tax code was proposed by the House of Delegates and agreed on by your father. It may not be easy to change. Nor should we. Taxing nobles would be an attack on the very backbone of Rizian society. Yes, our family's investment power investments power half the businesses in the country. Why should we be forced to pay double? Um, what? Uh, we shouldn't disincentivize families like yours from supporting Rizia's economy. That's true. We'll just take it from them. Nationalize everything. <sighs> I'll drop the subject for now. <laughs> That's how to piss everyone off in the room, right? In terms of our province's individual contributions, the GDP in Valkyries is off the charts thanks to the wine and gas and tourism industries. Brennus is still suffering the effects of the loss of Isa and Zill. However, it's made advances in shipping and agriculture alongside the gold mines. Manufacturing concerns in Carta's moniker are doing very well, to the point that business councils are complaining about an imminent shortage of skilled workers. A shortage of Rizian workers, Elena. Those vacancies could easily be filled with migrants from Valen and Derdia. That's a slippery slope there, Mr. Equibel. Are you, are you familiar with Rizia's two-tier employment system, Your Majesty? Uh, please explain it to me. After the Valen Civil War, we began granting labor hand visas to Vesic migrants and smaller numbers of Derdians. Labor hands may accept employment by Rizian Industries, but they don't have the right to Social Security or other benefits, and there's a cap on how much they're allowed to earn. They now make up most of our blue-collar workforce, with higher-paid jobs held by native Rizians, as well as smaller numbers of Lespasians, Vagslandians, and Rumbargians. The program did wonders for the economy when King Valero initiated it, but as a result, we now have millions of workers in this country who are being treated like second-class citizens. Those visas were granted to temporary residents? They were supposed to go home at some point? See where you're going with this, but granting them full employment rights would lead to a flood of uncontrolled migration. If the system functions, I've seen no need to change it. They should have the same working rights as Rizian counterparts, especially if they're paying taxes. Mm. Rights for all! Uh, Actually, this is kind of... This is not that dissimilar to the way that uh, the Boer republics in, uh, in South Africa existed before the British invasion there where they had like they allowed migrants in to work the mines because children yearn for the mines um, but they didn't actually have rights not that it like this is similar in a lot of places but especially specifically in terms of like resource extraction and gold mines which this country has uh, it was definitely that's the case but let's see what they say about temporary visas that was the initial aim, but Rizia's current day economy now relies on these workers. All the more reason they deserve an upgrade in status. Rizia offers Vezek's asylum where other countries did not. There must be some limit to our generosity. I recall you once supported that stance as well, Your Majesty. Uh, so here's my problem. My goal is to retake the territories of 
Zill, and Palos. I need to do that. I need to be able to pay for a big military. I will not be able to pay for a big military if I have to start giving benefits to all these other workers. I did and still do. I'm all for diversity, but we Rizians cannot allow ourselves to become outnumbered. I was a different person back in those days and no longer support Su Omna, the values it stands for. From a purely pragmatic point of view, expanding foreign worker rights does seem like a convenient solution to the shortage Elena mentioned. And from a security standpoint, allowing migrants to enter more, earn more money would curb the kind of black market activities that have been taking place in cities like Isa. I'm surprised that Lucidia is actually in favor of it. Do you not fear the dilution of Rizian culture and values, Duchess Cesaro? Or the infiltration of Das Nurists and Gynec... What? Golcondists into our versed society? She shrugged. Societies change, Your Grace. And I don't recall these concerns being raised about the Rumbergians who moved here after our alliance. I can already tell you you're going to be a brilliant addition to this council. <laughs> um, okay. To tell the truth, I'm not thrilled about any of those groups. Rizzi is a multicultural nation now, Hugo, whether we like it or not. Uh, sure, we'll go with one. Let's blow smoke up her ass. Although I'm going to piss off my uncle. <laughs> we seem to have veered off topic. Can we get back to your question about the economy? That's all the information I need for now. Elena glanced down at her notes, an expression completative. I'd like to discuss several economic considerations we should anticipate potential expenses arising from our pending fish fiscal policies. What's the... Is there a max? Minimum budget is zero, max is 25. So I can't deficit spend like we could in Swordland? Oh. Please elaborate. The first point is to consider industrial growth. I'm all for expanding production and construction, but we should make sure we have the energy to keep our facilities humming. Secondly, there's the matter of living standards. Improving the quality of life for our citizens naturally leads to higher administrative expenditures. Thirdly, if you decide to listen to Duchess Azaro and expand our defense capabilities, keep in mind that the cost of upkeep of our armed forces will rise accordingly. Lastly, energy management poses its own challenge as we approach the limits of our grid's capacity. We may incur additional shortage costs, storage costs. I appreciate your insights. Frankly, I'm glad to see you taking such an interest in our financials. Between myself and the House of Delegates, we were able to keep everything running smoothly in the absence of clear guidance from your father. But with a king of your caliber at the helm, there is no telling how high we can soar. History shall know me as Romus, the fiscally responsible. Uh, okay, that's just hilariously sarcastic. I love it. Um, your hard work during my father's decline is to be commended. Please leave my father out of this. I prefer to be judged on my own merits, not compared to him. <laughs> Send no king ever. Uh, yeah, your hard work's to be declined, commended. Gold is where most of our profits are coming from today, and it holds a special place in our history, but I maintain that natural gas would be a more fruitful investment. I'll let you think about it, Your Majesty. Thank you, Miss Werner. This was indeed enlightening. Pleasure to finally share these chambers with you, King Romus. I'm looking forward to our upcoming security briefing, and congratulations on surviving your first council meeting, Your Highness. I found it fascinating, Your Grace. They smiled at each other, not altogether sincerely. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for today's episode. We've been about an hour. We've been going for about an hour, so we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, this was a pretty long live stream from the other night, so I hope you guys are enjoying these. I know it's not the fastest pace. It's mostly me just reading text, but it is a, a truly brilliantly put together game. The music is awesome. The writing is awesome. I can already see, I think, but we'll see what the twists are where some of the plot lines are going. But we'll see. There's a lot that hasn't even been uncovered. We haven't even looked at the military aspect. There's an aspect to the game of managing your military. Uh, but we'll take a look at that perhaps in the following video. 
Until then, though, this is the Historical Gamer once again saying thank you very much for watching, and until next time, I'm out.